What's up, everybody? Welcome to SI Now. It is Tuesday, February the 21st. I'm Matt Stryker. And I'm Maggie Gray. Glad to have you with us. Yes, and you look marvelous. Oh, today. that is, I can't take credit for any of it. We have very talented hair and makeup people in the back. They don't get enough shout outs. They deserve more. Well, there you go. Coming up on today's show, Matt and Maggie are sponsored by the letter M. <laughs> as we Street. talk money, player moves, motherhood, and March Madness. We can do Sesame Street if you'd like later. <laughs> That's setting the bar pretty high. I don't know if Sesame <laughs> Street's pretty pretty clever. But we begin with the NFL today. Roster shakeups are coming, Matt, with some of the league's biggest names potentially on the chopping block. Why? There'll be casualties of the salary cap. Chris Burke has written about it. He joins us now. Chris, let's start in Kansas City. Their quarterback situation just got much more interesting with Peter King's speculation that Tony Romo may land with the Chiefs. So let's take that into account. Take their salary cap situation into account. What does Kansas City's quarterback depth chart look like next season? Well, uh, Romo's obviously the big name that could move there. I mean, I, I think it's tough. I think this is part of why there hasn't been a move yet on Romo because he's obviously carrying that huge contract for the next two, three years. Uh, and Kansas City right now is pretty flush up against the projected cap. So they're, you know, four or five million dollars. They'll get some more when they decline Nick Foles contract uh, if they do that, which would get them six million. I think Jamal Charles is the other one uh, who could be out there. Um, six point two million cap hit. They wouldn't have any dead money. So they can free up some money for Romo. That's still a big move, especially considering they have. Uh, Alex Smith in tow there. My gut still tells me it's Alex Smith next year for at least one more year, but I think they do have to start planning for the future beyond Alex Smith. Romo would help them plan for the present. I don't know that he would be their long-term answer there. I want to follow up on Jamal Charles. If he's a cap casualty, where are some of the potential landing spots? He's a four-time Pro Bowler, 30 years old, and of course has only played eight games in the last two years. Yeah, well, I think some of it's going to depend on what sort of contract he's looking for. I mean, if he wants to be paid like one of the best running backs in football, that's going to be a tough sell given that injury history. I mean, if you're talking about just going somewhere uh, to be a starter, maybe even if he wants a one-year deal to prove that he still has it and then look for big money uh, the following year, I mean, I think you look at any team, basically any team that needs a number one back. I mean, Minnesota kind of jumps out. Uh, if Adrian Peterson moves on, that's a team certainly – that could use some help. But really, again, I mean, I think you could talk about potentially any team that just needs uh, some help on offense at running back to look for him. Even a team like Oakland in the AFC West. I mean, Latavius Murray is a guy I'm not sure that they're sold on keeping beyond uh, what they had him for. And, and that depth chart doesn't necessarily have a clear number one back. So that's kind of an interesting one to watch. Maybe he just jumps to another AFC West team. Oh, to a division rival. Yeah. What a stab in the back that would be. Well, with regards to the New York Jets, is it a foregone conclusion that they part ways with Darrell Revis, which in turn frees up about $10 million in cap money? And if so, what does the franchise do with that money? Well, I think it's at this point, I think you have to assume that Darrell Revis is out. I mean, we saw the drop off and play from him last year was pretty apparent. I mean, he's not the he's not Revis Island anymore. You know, he's just not that guy. Uh, and, and it's understandable given how long he's been in the league, how long he's been effective. But um, for the contract he's looking at, yeah, like you said, 15 million dollars and 10 million coming back if they cut him. And now the off field situation. I mean, I think that it's uh, I would say pretty close to a foregone conclusion that they move on from him. Um, that's it's tough, you know, knowing exactly what the Jets will do because you lose a guy like that. You've obviously got to fill in some spaces on the back end. I think quarterback again is their number one priority this offseason, though. So you look at any of those draft picks that we keep talking about at quarterback possible for them. I think maybe more so, you know, they go the Ryan Fitzpatrick route, but try to be more successful with it and look at. Tyrod Taylor, if he becomes a free agent, look at, uh, you know, maybe maybe they kick the tires on a Romo trade. I mean, any of those veterans that could step in uh, and help them win in the near future, I think they should have some money to go after them. We should mention also in terms of off the field situation, Revis due in court on Thursday of this week. We'll see how that situation shakes out. Chris, it's not easy 
But there is some Cowboys news that may be sneaking under the radar. Dallas restructured the contracts of Tyron Smith and Travis Frederick, according to reports. They're two of the most talented players on the most talented offensive line in the NFL. So this frees up about $17 million. What will the Cowboys use that money on? Well, I think you're going to see Dallas really go hard after some defensive players this year. I mean, that's still, we think about 17 having $20 million under the cap. I mean, whatever they wind up at, uh, it sounds like a lot. That's still not a ton of money when you talk about if they extend any guys, uh, if they bring in one big name free agent, that pretty much wipes that all out. So, you know, they'll be active the way that they always are with Jerry Jones. And I think defense is where you'll see them focus. They still need to get better in their pass rush. Uh, maybe get a little more athletic at linebacker. So there's some spots there. I think the other spot that you pay attention to them is that wide receiver. They could really use a number two guy to go with Des Bryant. I don't think they have that on their roster currently. So you look and try to figure out if there might be some pieces there that fit into that role that aren't going to be paid like a number one receiver that aren't, you know, kind of off the charts guys, but uh, could help them in that spot. I think they'll they'll look to those areas uh, this offseason. Again, not a ton of money. They're not looking at 50, 60 million available, but they should have enough to sort of tweak what was a really good roster this year. All right. I'm sure there'll be plenty of news coming out of the NFL this offseason. Chris, we thank you for your time. Sure thing. All right. So we turn from the NFL to the wheeling and dealing of the NBA. The buzzer sounds on the deals Thursday, February 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern, and there is plenty of social media hype surrounding my favorite time of the year, the NBA trade this deadline. This is your favorite time of year. <laughs> Absolutely. This is what, if you ever played fantasy sports or Madden or anything, trading is what it's all about. I so, mean, this is the best, nicest possible way. Get a life, <laughs> Matt Stryker. All right. This is your favorite time of year. Inspired by the antics of the Celtics last night, we would like to play a little game of NBA emoji roulette, where Maggie and I will assign emojis of our own to the biggest storylines in the NBA. So, last night, Celtics star Isaiah Thomas tweeted out an eye emoji. The last time he did this, the Celtics landed Al Horford shortly thereafter. Isaiah wasn't the only one causing Twitter speculation, as teammate Jay Crowder also tweeted out three vague emojis last night, and both he and Jimmy Butler removed their Celtics and Bulls-affiliated cover photos. All of this fueling speculation that the butler is coming to Boston. So, Maggie, yeah. which emoji did you give to all of this? Okay, I love our Photoshop there with the butler already in the Celtics uniform. Good one, Zach. Wishful thinking. I'm giving this a wink emoji. This is not only Isaiah Thomas trying to really test his own celebrity and power in the league. How much can one tweet? How far can this one tweet go? This is Jimmy Butler and Jay Crowder former college teammates at Marquette having a whole lot of fun with everyone. Now, the person who should not be winking is GM Danny H. He actually has been <laughs> stockpiling these draft picks, waiting to make a big deal. I think the Celtics should make this deal for Jimmy Butler if they're going to get back a, a draft pick that could lead to their eventual rebuilding in Chicago. I think it'd be a good, good fit for Chicago. I think Jimmy Butler fills in in Boston, makes them instant contenders against the Cavaliers in the Eastern sure. Conference. I like this, but I'm giving wink emoji to the whole thing going on with the players. Now, you do know that the kids use emojis for brevity, right? So that they just, the emoji speaks volumes. Yeah, we're speaking itself. hieroglyphics these days. <laughs> where language is over, so well, 2014. In our morning production meeting, my friend Mean Gene stated, stated that Jimmy Butler is not deserving of three emojis ever. I beg to differ. I think if Friday morning Boston wakes up with both Jimmy Butler and Jaleel Okafor in green, then everyone will be sending smiley face emojis all around Beantown. Jaleel Okafor, so yeah. again, the third team involved here. 76ers are also going to be involved. Let's see. All right. Well, the other NBA trade chatter is centered around a potential Tom Thibodeau, Derrick Rose reunion in Minnesota. These two obviously have history together back in Chicago. Matt, what emoji are you giving this potential trade? If the New York Knicks were a human being, I would believe they would want Derrick Rose just out of their body. Oh, He's God. backing them up. So I am going with so my specific. favorite, the poop emoji for this one. There you go. Scratch and sniff. Oh, God. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, I do love the poop emoji normally, but that just got way too graphic. I'm going to go with the X emoji. It's not a Des Bryant X. It's a please don't do this X because these two teams have two very different 
uh, motivations as the end of the season is going to be coming near. Derrick Rose, he's obviously playing for contracts, so he wants to be the one-man show. Get out of the way. Let me show the rest of the NBA and GMs what I can do. Meanwhile, the Timberwolves, it has not worked in year one under Thibodeau. They have the third worst record in the Western Conference. You need to start now developing these guys. Wiggins, Carl Anthony Towns, they don't want to be standing around watching Derrick Rose just, you know, go to the hole every single offensive possession. So for me, X up, don't do this. Not a good marriage this time around. So the poop and the X. All right. Well, we talking agree. about a trade that actually has already gone down, the story of DeMarcus Cousins to the Pelicans has continued to grow. Yesterday, Kings GM Vlade Divac made some interesting comments about the trade. We will get probably, most likely we will get less because I had a better deal two days ago. Than what you got now? Yep. And you, then you, you had a better offer for Cousins well, two talk, days ago? Talk to, talk to those agents, they, what they say. So what? It, I don't want to go in details. I don't want to discuss about uh, the the process. It was a big process for us. Okay, that was Vladi Divac. Looks like he hasn't slept in about a decade. I'm giving this the Pinocchio emoji. Somebody is not telling the truth here. And I'm not sure if it's Vladi Divac, if he is now being so crucified for this trade that he is now either pointing fingers at the <laughs> agents. If so, that doesn't set you up for signing big time free agents uh, moving forward. Or if ownership was the one who wanted to ship out DeMarcus Cousins, well, then obviously Vlade is lying about it and he's playing the agents as well. I mean, the fact that character is now playing a factor into this equation. <laughs> no, that's a lie. If DeMarcus Cousins was winning despite being a malcontent, they would pay him the $200 million. Absolutely. This has nothing to do with character. This has everything to do with money, in my opinion. So Pinocchio emoji goes to Vlade Divac. All right. Well, what I put the angry face emoji on there because if I'm a Kings fan and I hear that you had a better offer, I'd be annoyed. Pretty annoyed. All right. Well, a lot it remains. Like it does. <clears throat> a lot Good remains morning. to be seen. A lot of planning and deciding, not just in the NBA, but in life as well. And Maggie, you sat down with Hannah Jeter I to did. talk about her plans, her upcoming decisions and much more. Let's take a look. For the fifth time, Hannah Davis in the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Let's check this out, shall we? This is gorgeous. You were in Mexico <laughs> and a little bit different this time because yeah. were you pregnant on the shoot? Well, I didn't know I was pregnant at the time, so I can't like fully take that's not a pregnant body so I can't like <laughs> for all the ladies out there they're like oh that's not fair I mean I, I didn't know I was pregnant so um yeah you're not a stranger obviously to this magazine you've been on the cover before but how is this shoot different well I what I was shooting in Tulum in Mexico which was nice because I live in Florida now so it was about a two-hour flight so it was very easy and I didn't have to deal with jet lag because normally <laughs> I'm in China or Tahiti um Bora Bora, you know, they just take you everywhere. So I actually preferred to fly somewhere a little closer because I don't like flying and I don't like the jet lag. So it was perfect. It was, I was nice and rested and ready to go. Just saw your ring there. I was like temporarily blinded. Congratulations. Thank you. Getting married, now having a baby with Derek Jeter. You wrote this very personal essay for Derek's website, the Players mm -hmm. Tribune, and it was really thoughtful. I really appreciated hearing all these thoughts that you had about your relationship because I know you guys were so secretive for such a long time. What were you most looking forward to sharing? Well, you know, we, we are so private and um, we've been private for a reason, but I kind of wanted to give maybe his fans, I guess, a little insight into why we did it that way, because it was all sort of by design. And also I was just working through myself with this story, figuring out what I'm gonna tell my kids you know, one day. And it really was a hypothetical. And then once I got pregnant, um, it's a reality. It sort of came to fruition. And I thought, okay, so how can I insert this into the story? So it was something I was going to do with the Players Tribune anyways. Um, but then once I got pregnant and, you know, the timing of, of SI launch week, I thought, well, I'm going to have to say something because I don't want to deal with the speculation and, and, you know, rumors and stuff like that. So I thought if I address it, it'll make it easier. We love the photographs of you handing him 
the pink balloons to show him that you are having a yeah. girl. Was that the first time that he knew that you were pregnant? I mean, the looks on his face, wh how would you describe those? Well, he knew I was pregnant, but he didn't know we were having a girl. So, yeah, I, I just blew up some balloons and had him in the house. And then there's one photo where he's kind of looking through the balloons. I mean, how would you describe that face? You know him better than anyone. What? It was a uh oh face. <laughs> Mm -mm. Yeah, it's it's a girl. <laughs> Travel. He, you also write in the Players Tribune that he sort of had this name picked out, and you kept saying, "We'll see." I, I know you're not going to reveal what that name is, but is it baseball related in any way? He doesn't no. want to name it like Mickey Mantle or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's it's a really girly name, <laughs> and um, yeah, but he's. We've talked about this for a long time, so this has been a name he's always really loved. Um, but I think now I have no opinion on anything. I, I don't know. I'm not there yet. I have to, I think towards the end, I'll be thinking about that. But for now, it's just, let's just get through it. Yeah. Well, you're glowing and, <laughs> and enjoy it every moment of it. And again, congratulations. Thank These you. These photos are absolutely stunning. Thank you. Great to talk with you. You too. Listen, it could have been a baseball-related name, like instead of Yogi Mariano, Thurman Jeter. Mariana. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure. there's a couple really. Tino? Yeah, Tina? That, that was T fun stuff. You asked good questions. Tina Martinez. I enjoyed that. Nice. Uh, we're just about two weeks away from the college basketball conference tournaments for an early look at the bracket and much more. Let's welcome in our own Michael Beller. Michael, thank you for being here. We appreciate your time. Absolutely, now, uh, guys. Thanks for having me this morning. Of course, you wrote a great article for SI entitled Bracket Watch that I re recommend that everyone read before filling out their office pools. So with that said, in your opinion, which top team is most vulnerable heading into championship week and why? Because we've seen it actually sort of unfold over the last few weeks. Uh, Virginia, I think, is going to be recalibrating expectations going into the last couple of weeks of the regular season. And then ultimately championship week. Four straight losses to Virginia Tech, Duke, North Carolina, and Miami. And what we've seen from the Cavaliers is a real inability to score. Uh, not sure if you watched last night their game with Miami. 54-48 in overtime. Yeah. These two teams need it just to get to that modest total. And really what you see from Virginia is if it's not London Parentes putting the ball in the bucket, nobody is doing it. And now you're looking at an ACC that is incredibly deep, probably the best uh, conference in the country, one of the best conferences we've ever seen. And because of the way that this, uh, champ this uh, conference's tournament unfolds, Virginia could be looking at starting that run on Wednesday, playing a team like Virginia Tech. And if they get past that, then looking at a matchup with a team like North Carolina or Florida State. It's just a tough road, and I think that's ultimately going to push uh, the Cavaliers down to a 6 or a 7 seed, where just a few weeks ago they could still talk about maybe getting themselves a 1 or a 2 seed. It has been a dramatic and rapid fall for the Cavaliers. Wow, well, from one extreme to another, Bubble teams are always intriguing, both to the casual and hardened college basketball fan. Which bubble team intrigues you the most and why? I want to stick in the ACC because they're going to give us a couple of really intriguing bubble teams. The one that stands out to me most is Georgia Tech because they present the committee with a couple of competing narratives. On one side, the good side, three huge wins for this Georgia Tech team. They beat North Carolina. Notre Dame and Florida State and there are few bubble teams that can say they have maybe even one win of that caliber let alone three so that is something that really stands out for Georgia Tech now on the opposite side a bad RPI in the 70s and also a bad Ken Palm ranking in the 70s we know that those metrics are starting to get a little bit more notice from the selection committee so that is going to be working against the Yellow Jackets they also have 11 losses and guys going back to 1985 when the uh tournament expanded to 64 teams we've only seen six get an at-large bid with more than 13 losses if we assume that georgia tech loses at some point in the acc tournament we're sort of talking about one more loss as not necessarily a death knell but really that uh sort of a line of demarcation that the committee has drawn over the last 30 years it is going to be a very interesting case that the Yellow Jackets bring to the committee on Selection Sunday. You know, I'm curious about RPI and how it's going to how it's going to play in. They're 76 right now in the country. Last year, Syracuse got in 71, made it all the way to the Final Four. So I'm just I'm curious about how that's going to play in to the Yellow Jackets and their bid to get into the tournament. I want to ask you about one of basketball's biggest conferences, and that's the Big Ten, Michael. Despite having five teams with 20 wins or more, 
You have the thoroughbreds, Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State. All seasons I would call dicey, and I think I'm being nice there. How could this down year for the conference impact the bracket as a whole? Well, we're already starting to see it, right, guys? I mean, a couple of weekends ago, uh, the committee revealed their top 16 teams for the first time ever a month before Selection Sunday, and there were no Big Ten teams in there. And while teams that could have maybe been included as a four seed, Wisconsin and Purdue, really the ones that stand out, those teams are safe. Teams that you mentioned, Maggie, Michigan, Michigan State, and certainly Ohio State, had to look at that a uh, little bit askance because now if the committee looks at the top teams as being down, then you know what they think about the bubble teams as well. I think Ohio State probably out. I think Michigan and Michigan State both have good cases. I have them in my field of 68 in this uh, week's recent bracket watch, but still work to do before these teams can feel safe. And you're going to see, I think, the Big Ten uh, contribute its fewest teams into the field in some time. Still some power at the top, especially with Wisconsin, Purdue, Maryland, the three teams that are definitely going to make it from this conference. But it is a weaker conference at the top and a weaker conference all the way through to the bottom. That's going to trickle down to the bubble this season. Okay, so fewest teams from the Big Ten in a while. What are we talking about? Are we talking about five? Are we talking about fewer than five? How many get in? No, I think we're still going to see seven teams from this conference. As I said, Wisconsin, Purdue, Maryland, absolutely no doubt about those three teams. Northwestern and Minnesota, we can't yet call those two teams locks, but I think by selection Sunday, neither of those teams is going to have anything to worry about. And then right now, as I said, I have Michigan and Michigan State in as well, and I think that those two teams will do enough to remain in. The one wild card in this conference is Indiana because they have those two huge wins from the non-conference when they beat Kansas and North Carolina. But their conference season has just been such a nightmare, really, from the start that they are going to need to do a lot of work over the next couple of weeks and probably make a deep run in the Big Ten tournament. If they do that, then you add what they did against Kansas and North Carolina, and they could sneak their way in. But ultimately, I think they're going to be on the outside, and we're going to see half of this conference, seven teams, go to the dance. All right, Michael, great stuff. Thank you for your time. We'll talk to you again. All right, guys. Thanks for having me again. All right, so do you fill out 100 brackets every year? No, I no. fill out one or two. I, I'm really rooting now for Northwestern, though. That would be a fantastic story, getting to the dance for the first time. That'd be sweet. Well, I like upsets, but I, I, I'm a big Florida Gator fan. I think they really stand a chance. And the question is, does Villanova repeat? That's the question. We got plenty of time for Fine. all that. Okay, plenty. this is a story that unfortunately has become all too common in international soccer. Players being subjected to racist slurs and chants by the fans. The latest indignity was aimed at Everton Luiz, a Brazilian midfielder playing for Partizan in the Serbian Super League. Frustrated by the ongoing abuse, Luiz gave the middle finger to fans, which incited a bench-clearing brawl between Partizan and their opponent, Rad. Now, keep in mind, this was a championship game, and Luiz left the field in tears before the game was finished. He said this after the match, quote, I've been suffering racist abuse during the entire 90 minutes and also was upset by the home players who supported that. They were all attacking me. I want to forget this as soon as possible. I love Serbia and the people here. That is why I cried. But please say no to racism. For more, let's welcome in senior soccer writer Grant Wall. He's joining us from Munich, Germany. Grant, it's not the first time we've seen or heard racist chants, but a player walking off the field of a championship game in tears. Have you ever seen anything like that? You know, I don't think I have specifically that instance, but it's far, far too common, especially in Europe, where I am right now here in Munich, um, to see examples of blatant racism taking place at soccer games uh, from the stands. Uh, you know, often directed at black players. Sometimes it's monkey chants. Sometimes it's bananas being thrown. And soccer's got a huge problem, Maggie, and they aren't doing enough still to make it better and get rid of it. Grant, this is obviously terrible for everyone. You see in the video of this championship match when Louise reacts to the crowd and the chants, the opposing team confronts him. Do you feel that the home team has a responsibility, even, dare I say, a power, to help defuse all of this? Oh, of course they do. And that clearly didn't happen in this case when you have players on the field. Uh, you know, usually when this happens, and it happens with far too much frequency, you at least see the players front whose fans are acting this way 
trying to get the crowd to stop doing this, and that did not happen in this game in Serbia. And this is all in a bigger context here. Just a couple of months ago, FIFA, the world governing body for soccer, disbanded its anti-racism task force. And the message that came out of that was, well, we don't think racism is a problem anymore in soccer. And obviously it is. Maggie and I were just talking a couple of weeks ago about Mario Balotelli facing racism at a game in France on the show. So what needs to happen here is this doesn't need to, this shouldn't be a light punishment for the fans of this team. They, you know, sometimes you see teams being fined, you see uh, light punishments like that. I want to see teams lose points in the standings, and after repeat offenses, I want their season to be over. You know, you can't, otherwise you're just condoning this. Yeah, I mean, Grant, FIFA clearly not taking this issue seriously enough. If we don't see changes soon, could it come to the point where games are going to be played in empty stadiums? Would perhaps leagues go that far? Well, we've seen that. Uh, we've seen... Uh, you, know, you know, crowd bans in response to violence in the stands, in response to racism in the stands. To me, that's not strong enough. You know, you've got to hit a team where it hurts, and that's in the standings, and then by just shutting the team down altogether for the season. Uh, that's the only way you can actually get this to stop, I think, is uh, putting some real teeth into things. And you see examples of this uh, you know, racism in European soccer all the time, and I'm really getting sick of it. You know, just today you saw uh, the Russian Soccer Federation uh, announce that a former Chelsea player's Russian, Alexei Smertin, would be the head of their new uh, anti-racism task force in Russia, head of the World Cup there. And this is the same guy, Smertin, who told the BBC two years ago that r racism did not exist in Russia. Mm. And so... Um, you know, it's just a problem that hasn't been dealt with enough or nearly severely enough. And so that's why things like this ugly scene keep happening. Yeah, it's no question that the beautiful game is clearly marred by all this. Do more players need to do what Louise did and walk off, stand up for themselves and others who can't? Yeah, players should walk off the field instantly with the support of their teammates and all the players on the opposing team. Uh, and I think it's also important here sometimes... When you see stories like this and the pictures are of black players, well, you know, it's important that white players and, and other, every other type of, of player out there speaks up against this. This isn't something just for, for black players to, uh, to say something against. It's for all of us to condemn in the strongest terms imaginable. I remember talking to Lilian Turam, the former French World Cup winner, about this, and he has dedicated his entire post-playing career to this topic of racism in soccer and educating kids and trying to get racism out of the sport, but it's not an easy task. And he's like, look, it can't just be on black players to fix this. Yeah, right, well, it's offensive not just to the players who are being targeted. It should be offensive to all of us that absolutely. this is happening. It, it transcends sports, and I think that all of us can begin to start the healing together. Grant, we thank you very much for your time. All right, guys. Take care. All right, well, that is going to do it for this edition of SI Now. Matt, thanks a lot. Great Thank job you. today. Thank Loved you. your emojis. We will be back tomorrow at 1030 a.m. Eastern with a fresh look at all the latest sports news. But until then, stick with SI.com and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. We'll see you tomorrow. James drove his RAV4 hybrid into Hard Knocks Canyon, where he confronted death again and again. But death would have to wait. He earned a man's gratitude and his shirt. How far will you take the all-new RAV4 hybrid? Toyota, let's go places.